So yes, I'm in a different location. Um, I can't promise that you won't hear snoring from either the child or the dog. I don't snore. They both snore. I don't snore. <laughs> Hi Booktube, it's Kim at Middle of the Book March. And is this thing on? Yeah, it is on. I'm all discombobulated. I'm in a different position than usual. I just thought I'd try it again. I've filmed from here before, so let's see how this works. I've got a weird light thing going on. Ah, whatever. Uh, this is my bookish week for March 20th. I'm actually filming this a day early. So I am going to wrap up two books that I finished this week. One of them, this is, I'm filming this on Friday, but one of them by the time it, this posts tomorrow, I will have finished. And um, it's my audiobook that I listen to in the car, and it is Big Girl, Small Town by Michelle Gallen. She is an Irish writer, and uh, this is her debut novel. I am listening to this on audio, and this is a funny one because I don't think I would be enjoying it as much if I were reading it because it is filled with Irish brogue, Irish dialect. And the narrator is Nicola Coughlin, who is, um, who is, I'm going to get the name, Claire in Dairy Girls on Netflix. If you have not watched Dairy Girls, it is hilarious. You must watch it. And she is also Penelope Featherington on Bridgerton. So her voice is brilliant in this, narrating this novel. It's, she's fantastic. But like I said, if I was reading this in print, I don't think that I would be enjoying it because there's a lot of terms and a lot of uh, Irish slang that I just would not know how to pronounce and I would not know the context of. So it's a debut novel which is centers on Magella, who is our protagonist. She is an, a young woman in her early 20s who works at a chip shop called Assault and Battered. It's an interesting name, but that's what it is. And uh, she lives with her alcoholic mother, who she is basically the caretaker for after her father has disappeared. And the book takes place about a week after the family finds out that Magella's grandmother has been violently murdered. She was beaten and murdered. And so this is about a week after that event. And so the way the book is set up is Magella keeps track by dates and times of a list of things that she doesn't like or the things that she knows quite a bit about and she's going to tell us about. It's a very interesting setup or um, structure for the novel and for the information in the novel. But we come to realize that Magella probably is somewhat on the spectrum for being neuroatypical. And she doesn't ever label herself as that. But just listening to her internal monologue and her conversation, um, listening to how she interacts with people around her, she has habits of rocking on the balls of her feet and also flicking her fingers. And it's, it's habits that she uses to calm herself down. And so we start to realize that this is Magella and her nickname is Jelly, only by a few people. She works with a man named Marty at the chip shop, and they have a kind of an on-again, off-again, um, friendly, physical relationship, even though he's married with children. Uh, the strength of the novel comes in the dialogue and comes in the characters. There were so many places where I laughed out loud. It's a very darkly funny book, and certain things kind of made me laugh, especially listening to Nicola's narration that I just was in the car and I was laughing out loud. But then in the next sentence, there's some pretty heavy topics. Bridges and buildings that have been bombed and destroyed. Uh, Catholics and Protestants antagonistic relationships. And it, it, like I said, it switches back and forth between that versus the hilarity that ensues when you know, Nicola, uh, Nicola, when uh, Magella talks to her customers in the chip shop and it's kind of a neighborhood shop. So everybody knows everybody and everybody in the neighborhood knows everybody else's business. And she has so many problems with that. So I've heard and read a bunch of places that the book is a combination of Milkman and Dairy Girls. And I have to agree with that. There's a lot of troubles history in the book but also so much comic dialogue and comic characterization. 
I'm really enjoying it. By the time I finished with it tomorrow morning, I would I would really have enjoyed it. Um, I to me, it's pretty obvious that it's a debut novel, but I do believe this author is, is highly talented. Um, just as an FYI, she also identifies herself as neuroatypical. She suffered from a traumatic brain injury um, in her, I think, her late teens, early twenties, due to encephalitis and. When she was under medical care for that, her doctors also said she probably was already on an autism spectrum somewhere because of her childhood behaviors and a lot of other symptoms and signs. So it's a really interesting perspective from the author herself, um, writing about the character of Magella, who um, I have a lot of affection for. So it's definitely a really good book. I'm really enjoying it and I will have enjoyed it by the time I'm officially finished. I finished a second book this week, and I've talked about this a couple times. This is Now in November by Josephine Johnson. Josephine Johnson published this book in 1934, when she was 24 years old. Her first novel, it won the Pulitzer Prize in 1935. Uh, I... I was kind of blown away by this book. It's gorgeous in its wording. It's a beautiful depiction, and it's going to sound ironic, but it's a beautiful depiction of a family trying to survive the depression. It is a, a father and his wife with their three daughters who have left the city after the father loses his job at a lumber company because they have no more use for him. So they, he brings his family to a very highly mortgaged farm where they're going to try to make a life and survive. Johnson in this book writes so acutely of the, the landscape. If you are a fan of landscape and, and nature writing, this is a gorgeous book. Um, I've, I've made the mistake of reading some Goodreads reviews. <laughs> and Goodreads can be a pond of swill when it comes to literary merit and literary review. And one of the things I wanted to say about this book is I read so many reviews that were one or two stars from re reviewers who said, oh, this book is so depressing, I couldn't stand it. Or I can't believe this won a Pulitzer, this, this was such a, a boring, depressing book. It was set during the Depression. It's going to be depressing. It is a bleak, lonely burdensome, depressing existence. It is a depression era novel. It has to be depressing. And it's it's very bleak. It's very hopeless in spots, but it's gorgeously set. It's gorgeously written. The characterization of these daughters and the father, you feel like you're under the same stress and tension as his family is. Um, it was, this is a gorgeous book. I wanted to read a few pieces of in the book because there is an introduction and an afterword and they both contain reviews and summaries and that type of thing. I'm going to try to do this quickly. Um, this is a review of the book. Now, again, remember she was 24 years old and this was her first novel. One of this, one of the reviews say, above all, now in November is extraordinary because of its almost clairvoyant insight. It's ripe understanding of things, places, and people. It's unaffected sensitivity to the minutia, as well as to the major issues of life. I have to wholeheartedly agree with that. It is astonishing that a girl in her early 20s should have composed a work which has such unpretentious but unmistakable power. It has, and how many books of this generation even suggest it, wisdom. And again, it's... 100%, that review is 100% accurate. It is, I, I still can't believe that such a young woman wrote this as her first novel and poured so much depth and breadth and emotion into the narrative. Um, good Lord, it is, it is such a gorgeously written book. Um, let me read part of this here. Uh, although Johnson sees human beings as gnats jerked about on the surface of the earth, she sees them also as sustained in nature and healed by it. 
Further, the reviewers noted Johnson's astute attention to the inner life of the five members of the Hal Haldmarn family, her understanding of the causes of anxiety and insecurity. And finally, reviewers caught Johnson's paradoxical combination of lyric and realist voices. One of the best terms to use to describe her writing is lyric. I've also read different summaries and reviews that call it poetic. Um, yes, this book had me on the first page, <laughs> and this is why. I can look back now and see the days as one looking down on things past, and they have more shape and meaning than before, but nothing is really finished or left behind forever. The years were all alike and blurred into one another, and the mind is a sort of sieve or quicksand, but I remember the day we came and the months afterward well enough, too well. The roots of our life struck in back there that March have a queer resemblance to their branches. The hills were bare then and swept of winter leaves, but the orchards had a living look. Page one, and yep, I was hooked. I was hooked on the language. I was hooked on the characters, on their inner lives. This was a bleak, lonely existence in the way she wrote that. Um, blew me away, and it's, it's just rich and deep and depressing and sad and gorgeous. And I highly recommend this novel to anyone who loves nature writing, landscape writing, um, authors like Willa Cather. Um, just pick it up. It's, it's beautiful and uh, well-deserving of the Pulitzer from a 24-year-old first novelist. I'm going to quickly show you what I'm currently reading. I am working through George Eliot, Voice of a Century by Frederick R. Carl. This is a rough one. It's pretty thick. It's dense. Um, I love George Eliot as a, as a writer and a person, uh, but I have to say this, it's a little bit of a slog, even though I'm not real far into it. I'm, I'm probably a hundred pages in a 643 page book. I slowed down on this in, in lieu of other books that I was more interested in at the time, but this is ongoing, and I would like to finish it <laughs> this month. I don't know if that's going to happen. What do I have? I have 11 days. We'll see. We'll see, because I'm also reading <laughs> Roots by Alex Haley for March of the Mammoths, and this one I am almost, well, I'm, a I'm less than a quarter of the way through. <laughs> Oh my gosh. We'll see if I can finish these two books. Um, I've been known to power through and, and, you know, in a week and a half, can I finish both of them? Maybe. I'm not sure. The first, the first 200 pages are um, the narrative of Kuna, Kunta Kinte's life in Africa with his family. It starts off with his birth and it goes to the age of 16 where he is kidnapped from his village in Africa and brought into the um, brought to America into slavery. But I started to think about that and and was exploring in my my own brain, am I bored with that? Why why am I getting a little antsy with reading this part of the narrative? If I started to realize what it was doing, it was setting him up to be a living person for the reader. And when we read about slavery and we read back into American history at this point in, in our time period, it's, it's too easy to look at the topic and the history of slavery and not realize, especially as a white reader, not realize what that meant, not understand the horror and the trauma of what that did to black African people. And it struck me that there was a quote that I was thinking about from a different book. And it took me about an hour last night to figure out where did I read that? And it came out of Toni Morrison's Beloved. But the, one of the passages that um, I finally realized came out of Beloved links with Alex Haley's narrative of Kunta Kinte's early life. And I've read this passage in, previous, in a previous video. I wanted to read it again. White people believed that whatever the manners, under every dark skin was a jungle, swift, unnavigable waters, swinging, screaming baboons, sleeping snakes, red gums ready for their sweet white blood. In a way, he thought they were right. 
the more colored people spent their strength trying to convince them how gentle they were, how clever and loving, how human, the more they used themselves up to persuade whites of something Negroes believed could not be questioned, the deeper and more tangled the jungle grew inside. But it wasn't the jungle blacks brought with them to this place from the other livable place. It was the jungle white folks planted in them and it grew, it spread. And that's the passage I thought of when I've been reading about Kunta Kinte's life in Africa and his village community. Um, the spiritual depth that, that, that these people had. Now, let me go back. This is, this is considered a novel. At one point when it first came out, it was listed as nonfiction. It could be a biographical novel, but it is, it is a novel. So, which is interesting because these are both novels and there's such a deep a spiritual link between the two. And that passage in Beloved, it, it humanizes the history of African people before they were taken into slavery. It removes the stereotype of the people living in a jungle. So that passage in Beloved had linked my thoughts to this section of the narrative in Roots, that it's humanizing um, this black family in the 1700s and their, their depth, their humanity, their intelligence. Um, it's very powerful and it's very powerful how that worked in my brain. And I was so glad to finally realize that that passage came from Toni Morrison's Beloved. I don't know if any of that made sense. I don't know if that was just a ramble, but it, it made a powerful link in my head. So uh, that's it for my bookish week this last week. Um, another reason I'm, I think I already mentioned another reason I'm making this video Friday is because I plan on sleeping late and going book shopping again tomorrow. My husband and I have a loose plan to try to go to um, my favorite used bookstore and try to see what else I can find. I think I still have an $18 credit on my gift card from Christmas. So I'll blow that pretty quickly. Um, and that's it for me. Uh, Sean, I hope you're watching because I made sure I scheduled this so when, when you woke up, you would be able to watch it instead of having to wait a day because I was late last week. Um, that's it. Thanks so much for watching. Write me a comment down below with any of your thoughts on this video or any of the books I mentioned. I hope you're having a great week and I will see you in the next video. Bye.